Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Dimple. Hi. That Thanks came, for having me. That came off funny as me saying it, but I did not mean it like that. <laughs> no, it's okay. Like a lot of people, like I, I get asked all the time, is that your real name? Like, um, and I'm, I, I always tell people, I'm like, I promise you, that is my real name. It can kind of lead into like the therapist thing. If you're like, life is so dimple. It's so simple. You know, that whole <laughs> sales pitch no i've actually like never done it that way actually i should probably use that i should i should put it in my bio i really wish i could create insight into my life to improve it like i do for everyone else (laughs) well you know sometimes i feel like it's like i hate that i can do that part and have like the therapist side to me and sometimes i'm like i just want to be like regular and be upset and not have to think about this whole other side of things and be able to be rational about things yeah when I started studying like psychology in school the weirdest thing was how you would come across so many therapists that would have their own therapist you're like wait a minute you're you're, you can't do that that's like cheating on top of cheating and it's like no it's because you can diagnose problems in someone else's life but the hardest one to diagnose is your own like a lot of the issues and things you have to kind of talk about. It's easier when you're doing it with somebody, even for a therapist, you know, they can't just sit there and craft out. Even me, I spend so much of my time in my own thoughts and I can't even craft out problems. I need someone to vent off to. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of it, they do tell us in grad school that you should get your own therapist. It's really um, healthy too, because there's a lot of things that will come up and often they tell us to like, you know, be aware of like your biases. Sometimes you don't know certain things come up and certain content that might be triggering for you. And so for me, when um, I, my introduction into psychology happened when I was 21 years old and I had a really bad car accident where I fractured my pelvis um, on my left side and it was at, I was at DePaul University. And so it was like right during like um, midterms, our fall quarter and everything. And so um, I went home and uh, it was like right after midterms, I went home and then I didn't go back for the rest of the quarter because I couldn't really walk. And I was like, also like recovering, going to physical therapy. I had like uh, my orthopedic surgeon's appointment. So luckily I didn't need surgery. But um, I did spend like those five weeks and I also spent the six weeks we have off for winter break. I also spent that kind of recovering um, and making sure I was ready to come back to school. And so like when I did eventually go back to school in January um, for a winter quarter, I thought I was fine. I like resumed everything that I kind of left off on and it was probably the biggest mistake I did. I wish somebody told me to slow down but I wanted to like pick up right where I left off. And so that's when I started having like my panic attacks and I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating. I felt like my stomach hurt so much that like, I felt like I had to throw up all the time because like that pit in my stomach, I just couldn't sit with it. And so, um, I like would tell my mom that like something was wrong and like, I think it's very common in a lot of minority cultures where it's like, you're fine, you're fine. Like, don't say anything. Don't really bring it up. Like, my mom told me not to bring it up to my dad. But I think it's just like, they're like that way. Of or or if you're like me and you are in a poor family and they're just like, we don't have medical insurance. You're like, oh, okay. So we just got to deal with this. Yeah, I mean, that's also the case, too, because you bring up a really good point that not everybody can afford, like, therapy, or it's very expensive, too, but also so are other doctor's appointments, too, and I think we often, like, neglect that part of our, like, health, but luckily at DePaul, which I always encourage everybody to look into, is what kind of counseling services does your university offer, and so they used to offer, like, 15-minute, like, consult sessions that you can just drop in. And then, or, and then if you did want to meet with a therapist, it was like, about, I think about 20 sessions for $5 each, which was actually like really affordable for me because I didn't want to tell my parents. And so I did it very secretly. And that was the first time, and I joke about it, that like at DePaul for my Psych 101 class, I think I got a C minus or something else because I did not do well in it. And look where I am now with a doctorate in clinical psychology. Um, But it, it was something that was really like powerful for me to be able to go into. And then I was able to kind of rebuild my life of what I had thought that my like my four-year plan, go applying to med school, doing all these different things, 
But like when my accident happened, I fell apart. So my plan fell apart and I didn't know how to pick up the pieces again. And so like there, my therapist helped me kind of rebuild that. But in a sense with all of that, I learned a lot about myself in the process. And for the first time at 21 years old, I was like, wait, I don't even know who I am. And so like growing up, like typically like, like in the South Asian culture, especially in my family, um, I just like did everything my parents told me, like, you're going to go to med school. All right. <laughs> like I hated bio. I hated chem. I hated all of those things and I wasn't good at it. And it really put a lot of pressure on me. And especially like, you know, like that model minority myth of like all Asians are going to med school, they're becoming doctors and stuff. And so it was really hard for me to kind of fit into that myth of just like, I don't want to do that, but I feel like I had no other choice. That's what gets, see, that's what really, uh, when I looked at your profile on Instagram, you said you specialized in South, is it, you said South Asian and. Oh yeah. No, not specialized more so, but more, um, along the lines that like, that's an area of interest just because based on like my own personal experiences growing up and then. It's realizing- more relatable. Yeah, and then realizing that if I felt this way, I knew there were other young uh, South Asian women uh, that probably felt the same way I did, but just couldn't really talk about it or know where to go. And so that kind of just started like that process for me. But even then, it took me a while before I said anything to um, my friends my friends about like what I was going through, what I was experiencing, because there's a lot of shame and stigma within my community about just mental health. And like through the years of just learning and practicing, I know that 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 applies to everybody too, that there is a lot of stigma and mental health isn't normalized. And I remember like when I first got into my doctorate program and I went to India to visit family, they're like, oh, you're going to work with crazy people. And I like, I use that time to like kind of correct their language of like, no, it's not crazy people. It's people who struggle with like their mental health and emotional, like all these struggles that they have that doesn't make them crazy. What's interesting about mental health is now you say it like maybe 10 years ago, people would have thought straight jacket immediately, but then you say, oh yeah, for sure. you start to look at kids that are like, on their cell phone that are kind of just like really depressed, kind of like the old school MySpace profile pictures we all regret with like the emo hair and stuff. And it's like, the interesting thing is mental health has the same payout, but each route of getting there is completely different. One from a minority's perspective. I mean, my doors were blown open when everyone complains about or talks about racism and how these certain groups are impacted. I'm like, the Asian culture is impacted the most, if I had to be 100% honest about it. Uh, it might not get politicized or everything, but they're the crack of every joke. It's, there, it's, it's always this type of thing. It's this stereotypical type, disaster type thing. I'm like, the reason why they don't care a whole lot is the factor of they're going to college and they're getting stuff done to where when they're 40, they can retire so they don't have any bills to complain about <laughs> and you're still working until you're 80. But it's the idea of when you start bringing in, like, for I'll use an example. I had a past guest. Um, I think her mm-hmm. name was Ramad. Uh, she was a little Muslim girl, but she was a writer and she was trying her best to get her book published. And she would talk about how she would put her name and face instead of at the front of the book, you know, where the person's like, hey, how's it going? She would put it towards yeah. the back because by the time you read the front, you read the inside. Mm-hmm and you get all the way to the back of the book, you've already loved the book. You've read the whole thing already. And at Mm -hmm. that point, just because you see the back and see who wrote it and be like, oh, it's her, it's a woman. You wouldn't think that because you Mm -hmm. love the whole entire book. Why would you sway your opinion based on a, a, a gender difference or a race difference? And that's when it starts, you realize how many people are have something that's affecting their life, whether it's environmental influences, genetic influence. And I dive down the road of invisible illnesses. You know, Mm -hmm. you talked about being in your car accident. You probably with the whole stress and everything that was going on and you starting to realize like, Hey, I'm not functioning like I used to. A lot of things aren't working right. I'm in pain. Sometimes I'm in doing this type of thing. Yeah. All those factors play in, but people hide these injuries, hide these. I definitely, I did hit it for, uh, hide it for a very long time until I got to the point where it was like really impacting me. And so to the point that I like knew if I didn't do something, I, it was going to impact me at school. And I, my biggest fear was like having to go home and either like drop out of school or like take a leave of absence. And I didn't want to do that again. 
Um, but the thing is, like, you know, what I've kind of come to realize is that my mom and I were both born in India. We moved here when I was one. And so for us, like, even though we were born in the same country, we were raised in two different cultures. So like my parents did raise me very traditional Indian and everything. And I'm, I'm bilingual, like I can understand everything. But also the thing is I grew up with the American culture as well. So for me, it was a lot easier to ask for help even if I was doing it secretly. Um, I think it would have been different, different if I wasn't able to do like the $5 sessions at DePaul um, versus like being able to do, like if I had to like pay like an X amount of money for it, I don't know if I would have gotten there because at that point I didn't want to tell anybody. But the thing is like, you know, like fast forward, um, like, so my, so, so my twenties were pretty much a crap show. I have no idea how I made it through, but like, um, so 2008 was my car accident, 2009, you know, like I went back to school in January and then like, you know, 2009 into 2010, like I was kind of just like recovering, trying to graduate. Like I ended up switching my major to psychology. I even like interviewed at a grad school um, for a master's program, but I got rejected, which is totally fine. But um, my senior year, the day before my um, finals, my last set of finals, my grandma had a congestive heart failure and my family had like a very hard time, like kind of letting go of all of that. And so my grandma was on life support for a year. And so like my mom ended up, my mom died by suicide in 2011. Um, and my grandma died a month after that. And then the following year, we had two more deaths in the family. My dad's cousin and his wife passed away. And then the year after that, my dad, my, uh, my dad's dad, my grandpa passed away. And then we had another death the following year in India, like my mom's cousin who died by suicide. I wasn't as close to him, but it just like was constant, like nonstop for a couple of years to the point that like when that kind of loss happens, I feel like I'm so numb to it, even though I am kind of like a, I am a professional now. I think I've been able to work through it, but like I was so used to negative things happening that when anything good happen I was so fearful that it would be taken away from me because I'm so used to negative outcomes so I expect things to go wrong which is not how things should be right um but for me that was my norm and so like when something good happened I didn't know how to respond so it impacted me like while I was dating it impacted me in school I became very anxious and it was hard and um I wrote like a, a little article for um, this like, online magazine where I talked about I'm a therapist and I have generalized anxiety. And I think it's like being open and upfront with like, even as a clinician, I go through my own things too, but I found a way to like uh, work through it in a healthier manner and like being open about it too. I think a lot of it, we tend to bottle things up because we're afraid about giving that off and seeing what answer people are going to really receive that with, you know, you talk mm -hmm. to somebody a lot of times they're like suck it up or yeah, that sucks. But like, I remember I had a moment um, in November, I had three tires go out in a matter of uh, like two weeks. And it was like oh. one of those things where I went out to my car at four o'clock in the morning and there's a nail in my tire. And I'm like, third tire in two weeks <laughs> and like I basically broke down in tears and I ran inside and I was hoping somebody would comfort me and give me mm -hmm. that it's gonna be okay but I got like that's life life sucks get used to it and I'm like fuck like that's not something you want to hear and then like just uh not even last month like I want to say towards the end of August um mm -hmm. I had you know my grandma got diagnosed with stage four lung cancer yeah. she had been hiding um, I had three friends that ended up sh uh, dying, one in a car accident, one fell off a balcony, and then one shot himself. So it was this whole thing of a lot getting piled up on top of me at once. Um, those types of things that I had faced in just recently and then still going through, it was like this nonstop like punch to the gut and you think you're picking up the shards of yourself. And then I'm thinking like, do, should I go to therapy where I just cut it off because eventually it was just becoming mm -hmm. too stressful to go. You just wanted to lay down and finding that light that seems like in a tunnel of darkness where you're never going to reach anything. It's always best to find someone to chat to. No wonder if it's a therapist, no wonder if it's anybody because what's really kind of brought into my mind from everything that's happened 
and trying to find myself. I always, it, like, I mean, I'm biased. But I, with it, seeing all that stuff too, like, you know, stuff that you went through as well, that type of stuff brings you to a better perspective into life a little bit once you're through it. And that gives advice to people that are listening to us right now that are trying to understand, you know, it's why people sell books on this stuff. It's the factor of they've been through something and they're giving you the information, mm -hmm. stuff that you could listen to. Like the reason why I keep this free is if anybody hears something that you or me might say might resonate with them, might yeah. just be the, the phrase of the words. Next thing you know, their life's a little bit better. I had my best friend has uh, suffered from severe depression where he wouldn't, he would just stop going to school because he was afraid people were going to make fun of him. And I'm just like, you know, I had fought. The only fights I've really ever been were over him because of people picking on him. You know, I might've got my ass kicked once or twice, but it was the aspect of like, the mind is so sensitive. It's so powerful. And the fact of if we can't, you know, people say, if you can't love yourself, you can't love other people. You can't love other people if you, do, if, 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 if anything, there's just, there's just this thing that's blocking us in society that doesn't mm -hmm. want us to be able to communicate. It's social media. It's all these things that choose, like when I sent you a DM or whatever, you probably thought it was going to be like, what's this person want? Why are they doing yeah. this? That's most of the population. Because no, I was, like, I was excited because I was like, hey, this gives me an opportunity to share. Um, and it gives me an opportunity to like kind of get my story out there or my experiences too. Because I remember when I was going through it, I like back in 2008 through like 2011, I had nobody. Like I could not, nobody like talked about it. None of my friends did. It was such a taboo topic. And I think like you realizing that, hey, I am a very social person, outgoing, but I have this whole other side to me that you would never know. And like, if you looked at my in mental health Instagram page, you'd be like, oh yeah, she comes off very confident or like knows what she's talking about. There are so many times where I'm like, ask my friends, I'm like, should I post this or not? Like, I don't know. Like, I know I have the degree and the title, but sometimes like, I feel like, oh, like an imposter of just like, am I saying anything that's relevant or is it really going to help somebody or not? But like, I like what you had phrased it as, you know, if it helps one person for me, that's my, like, that's all I care of, like being able to help one person or being able to relate to somebody knows that, hey, um, they're not alone. So like, I respond to every message that I get. If I um, can help them find a therapist or anything. Like I definitely like make it clear, but I also have to set boundaries in that perspective that I am not doing therapy over Instagram. <laughs> if And if you're in Illinois, then yes, I can work with you, but I cannot do it outside of state. And then, and, and like, you know, sometimes people do not like that answer and sometimes people are understanding of it, but I also have to make sure like, you know, I'm like, be ethically, I'm like doing the right thing. But also that big part of like social media is so much out there nowadays. And like, it's a good thing. And it can also be like a bad thing too, that, you know, we're comparing ourselves so much to other people and other content and creators and everything. But then like kind of it impacts our self esteem. But on the other side, too, you get to connect with so many people who are do who may feel like you and, and are going through similar situations and have gone through it and can give you hope and knowing that you're not alone through it. But I also always tell people, I'm like, the best thing I ever did, as fearful as it was for me in the beginning, was going to therapy. And I always tell people too, like, you know, sometimes finding the right therapist is kind of finding like the right medication. It may take a little bit. And so don't be deterred if like the first therapist or second therapist you work with isn't like a good fit for you. Um, it's okay. So I actually, right before we started this call, you know, like, I think if I had started early on, like a couple of years ago, I may have taken this a little bit personal, personally of, am I not a good enough of a therapist? Did I do something wrong? But I think it's taken me time and growth to understand that I might, I as a therapist might not be a good fit for everybody. Certain styles um, work better for other people and certain styles don't. Um, and so for me, like, I do love working with like, you know, children and adolescents, I feel like I am such a better fit for them. And this individual um, just called to say, like, you know, I just really wanted to talk to you and let you know that I don't think that our sessions are as effective. Um, I appreciate the work that you do and what we've done. But for me, 
um, I don't, I don't, I'm not getting what I want from this. And, and I like reassured her, I'm like, it's okay, like to feel that. And like, she's like, I'm really sorry. And I told him like, please don't be sorry about this. Like, I don't want you to feel that. Um, I really want, like, want you to know that I respect your honesty. And instead of like, you know, ghosting me as a therapist in her sessions, but like, I really appreciate you letting me know, like, I don't want you to feel bad. And that's okay. Sometimes like, you know, therapists are, might not be a good fit for you but it's at least I'm happy that you tried and you were able to tell me that and the emotional connection you can get same thing with talking to a friend or someone that is actually truly there to listen to you is the same thing you get with your therapist I remember um just recently I was talking to a buddy uh, that rides or he actually drives for you uh, USPS no it's not USPS UPS um mm -hmm. he comes comes into my work and uh, he was telling me, he's like, yeah, man, I'm going through a lot too. You know, we've known each other for like the past like couple of years. And he's like, yeah, my therapist just moved over the bridge in Baltimore. So yeah, I decided to call her and talk to her about it. Cause she's not gonna be my therapist anymore. And it's like, I've developed this relationship with like six mm -hmm. years with her. And then now it's gone. It's like, what do I do? You just feel like somebody's leaving you hot and dry with your issues. And it's like yeah. the, the mentality of a good therapist is the fact of, you want to know that that therapy one day is going to end. It's that, mm -hmm. that's, that thing is going to be over with. And which was crazy to me was I spent my whole entire childhood with my best friend, you know, going over his house, basically living over there 24 seven to find out in my twenties that his mom was a therapist and I had no freaking clue. <laughs> and it made me look back on all the times where I was like, wait a minute, all those times you asked me, is that what I really want? Like look inside yourself. <laughs> I, and I didn't even pick up on it. I was so clueless and she owns her own. I, I really try like not to bring like work outside of work because I feel like I need to have boundaries with it or else I feel like I'm going to drive myself like to burn out or things like that and setting those boundaries and now that I'm in private practice I feel like I really have to set those boundaries and making sure because knowing me I'd be like oh yeah for sure you can text me or you can call me but I also have to make sure I'm following that and that there is like a schedule there's structure and all these different things that I'm not burning myself out by doing too much or constantly being available. Well, it's so hard to once you study therapy or psychology or anything like that, you start being able to analyze everybody whenever you go anywhere. It's like the first thing somebody's angry, you're like, you're, there's probably something going on in their life right now that's making them feel this way. They're not just angry because Raisin Brand's $5 a box right now. There's no way. No, and I, that doesn't happen for me a lot, though. Like, I really try to separate it because, like, I want to have those boundaries because after, like, sessions, like, on Wednesdays, I have sessions from, like, 3.30 to 9 o'clock. And like, let's say if I go to dinner or go out afterwards, like I don't want to think about work after, or I don't want to overanalyze or anything like that. So I think it's for me, it's really important to set that boundary. But sometimes, yeah, like those thoughts will creep in and like sometimes it's like you'll understand, but it's also like, I, I think it does help me see things in a different perspective of like, you know, being a little bit, being more considerate, like, okay, somebody may be going through something and um, not jumping to conclusions or assuming something and like being patient with it. Do you ever find yourself after uh, maybe a few sessions in a row or maybe a session and you feel drained? Like it was just overall so horrible and exhausting to hear. Not like the fact of like what they were not complaining like, I about, say, but like, like a story. Um, I wouldn't say horrible, but I think like drained is like some, it would be a, probably a better word that, yeah, it definitely feels like draining at times. But I also have to remember, like, I'm there for a purpose. It's not about me. And if I need to take breaks, then, like, you know, I can schedule out, like, add in, like, breaks in between, like, 10, 15-minute breaks or anything. Um, and then if it's, like, to the point where I don't feel as well, then I, like, will make sure that I address it. And, like, or reschedule so that way I can be fully present there. And also, like, in sessions, too, like, I encourage, like, uh, my clients that I work with, like, hey, please let me know if I'm not summarizing or not understanding where you're coming from. Like, let me know so that way I can better understand you and reflect what you're saying and don't feel bad that you feel like you're correcting me or something like that. Like, I encourage you. And then I also frame it in a way that this is great a great tool to work on in here because like you'll need this outside you know kind of being assertive in that sense and being able to practice that and so like a lot of it's like teenagers I work with or young adults and it's that emotion like expression and regulation as well as communication skills that like and I always tell them like don't feel bad it's great to practice on me and then like kind of take that outside outside of a session 
when you're talking to a younger clientele, do you find that there's a lot more anxiety and a lot more kind of fear of this kind of pressure of becoming something? I feel like that's a lot that was going on with kids nowadays. It's like, there's this pressure to be like, it, it was a big thing when, you know, we're kids or something like you've got to, you have the opportunity to be yeah, president. Yeah, yeah. You have yeah. the opportunity to be like the astronaut. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you're starting to realize the world's not really like that, where you can be the president right off the back or all these types of things. And I think it's so different too. I think a lot of it is like these young, um, young teenage girls really like kind of comparing themselves to social media and especially um, like looking a certain way, feeling a certain way, that pressure, definitely like, you know, some eating disorder things. And a lot of it's that self-esteem, but there's, there's a lot that goes on for them. And I think a, a, a big part is like not having that safe space, space to express themselves or say what's on their mind. And I think because like, I think the other thing I've come to realize is that one, nobody would ever expect that I'm in my 30s. And, like they either like they would say like, you know, mid to like 20s or something. And so like, I've had that happen too, where like somebody in their late 30s didn't want to work with me because they felt like they couldn't connect in that sense, even though we're kind of similar in age. I felt like a lot of it was because I I may have looked younger or, you know, it could have been something else too that we truly just didn't connect. And I feel like with the younger, younger um, caseload that I have and young adults, I am a better fit for them because one, I do see that a lot of teenagers, like, you know, they don't like in that sense of like that con connecting that I get it, but also like they're able to explain it in a way that they don't feel like you know, I'm an authority figure or anything, but I do like, you know, challenge them and really work with them. And I set up those boundaries and like my expectations with them too. But I really work on building that relationship. And like, I always tell them like, I never lie to you. So I don't, I expect that you don't lie to me either. Cause then we're just like going nowhere. And so like I use humor and I also like try to connect with them too. And part of me, like, you know, I'm very, very careful of like when, and if I just, self-disclose anything because one it's not about me right but I can also phrase things in a way that kind of describes what they're feeling because I've been through it and I get it too you know I was a teenage girl once and so like I get certain parts of it that I say and they're like yeah that's exactly how I feel so even with time and age it doesn't matter that a lot of there's still some similarities within it and that part of just like accepting and being able to share what they want but also like making sure yes it is confidential unless i have to break it due to safety concerns um and even like with parents wanting i do have a lot of parents that are very respectful of that confidentiality and if it isn't let's talk about what what the session means for your child and what they're getting out of it versus what you need as well and so like really working with the family as well so i do work not just like with the teenager but i also work with the family as well in that dynamic of how can we provide a healthier space like connecting as well as communicating with each other i had seen that um the weirdest thing we talk about like family counseling and stuff because i know it works too is because when i was a kid my dad would do the smartest thing to settle agreements with the whole family which was he would pull up a chair have everybody sit down and then he'd pull out a notepad and everybody would pick out their issues that are going on that week what is your problem with him okay he stole this from you all right we'll get that back and then it was like this whole type of settling thing but i was like just doing that once a week you know have even over if it's family dinner or something you're talking about like hey i didn't like when you did that or something mm -hmm. just those connections can solve the most biggest issues in somebody's life and the problem is with how the world works with everybody needing two jobs and how technology has gone so far where netflix is more important than a family meal or something <laughs> in a lot of households that becomes an issue of finding that connection right and i think that biggest part is like well you know you we're fighting with that person or that person made you do that the biggest part is like i always have them reframe it in the sense of i statements because how do you feel about what the actions are so like i felt hurt when you were saying those comments to me or that like, you called me out for this or you weren't giving me attention whatever it may be because and then i also have people look at each other as they're talking and redirect it because you're to, I'm here to moderate and facilitate but like I want you to talk to each other that's a big part I think I've noticed a lot is that communication piece and the thing is like you're saying one thing the child the teenager might be saying one thing the parents might be saying one thing you guys are 
going at it with each other, but the underlying message and the thing is you're not hearing each other of like what you feel and how it's coming out and versus what your parents feel and how it's coming out. So let's talk about where everybody is and how do we come together in the middle. And I'm not saying like all of them are like great. There's times where it's still dif difficult. And sometimes in session, I'm like, I have no idea where this is going to go. And that or I have no idea how I'm gonna be. It's gonna go Jerry Springer style. That's what's gonna happen. And, and well, and let me knock on wood. Like so far, they've been good. They've been. Well, you can see my dog right there sleeping. Um, right here, this little one, Cookie. Um, but like you know, it's to the point. Like sometimes, like they're not gonna be the best. They're not gonna be like oh, happy, great family therapy session, right? Um, sometimes you, they may walk out and be like, okay, this is stupid and we're never going to do this again or sometimes they may be like okay well this was great to hear this perspective but there might be some parents that don't want that or there might be some teenagers that are like nope not going to do it well it's hard too because especially when you create something and you raise something you like i know people that want to consider that position of power absolute where they're like that's my kid i'll tell them what to do i'll do this type of thing i'm like it doesn't work like that anymore they're 20. oh well that, i think that yeah definitely with like times changing i do have like a client right now where you know they are struggling like with just like their identity piece of it and parents like protective factors and like clashes of cultural um identities too and you know growing up like kids are growing up definitely different these days and compared to like how I grew up that I was able to like you know it took me a while to figure out how to mesh both my Indian culture and the American culture together but like it's harder like you know as we grow up and we're going through and especially for kids now like feeling confused of where they want to be and how they want to do things versus like the parents who want like certain traditional ways of growing up or like kind of embed like making sure that they're teaching their kids what they knew and it's it it does create conflict within the family especially when there's different viewpoints of how to be and what what, what do you want to say and that freedom part of it too and so it's like really work and that's one of the cases that i'm working on right now kind of finding like a point in together of like where can we fit in and how can we find like a solution to it a lot of it if it's not too much of i guess a disattachment it's more of an attachment um the reason even why this podcast even started was a buddy that called me on top of his roof um because he felt like he was adopted and he didn't know but his parents had controlled every single action that he had in his whole entire life. He was the teacher's pet, like, you know, the yes, yes, mom, yes, dad type of kid. And then at being 23, 20s, he was just like, man, I really haven't made a decision for myself. I went to college because of my parents. I went to this because of my parents and all this type mm -hmm. of stuff because of my parents. And then that's the issue is that the parents invest their, their mistakes, their lives into their kids. And it becomes this thing where you got to realize right. that they got to live their own separate journey. And I think that's the thing too. Like I know a lot of parents mean well too. And I think it's that part of like that fear of like, we need to protect, we need to make sure things are safe too. And a lot of it is for me, I did grow up in this like a family where I was very much in a bubble, I would say. And it did take, it took me years to figure, like finally figure that out of like, you know, I always had a safety, safety net. Like, um, my only job was to like do well in school. Like I didn't have to work. Um, and I'm very thankful and fortunate of those opportunities too. But I also like saw these things that I didn't really have a chance to fall and learn from my own mistakes. Like my parents always either picked it, like, you know, were supportive and that like, so they made sure that I had everything I needed, you know, and that I never had to worry about anything. But also part of me didn't know how to be independent. So when my car accident happened, that was the first time where, because my parents, um, when my mom was still alive, like, I mean, their English was decent, but it wasn't like amazing. So like I had to deal with all the doctor's appointments, um, the medical providers, insurance companies, like everything. And I was doing that while I'm sitting on my couch recovering. Um, and I was 21 and, and I felt like, I don't even know what to do. Like I felt so overwhelmed because I never had to do any of these things. And then like when I went back to school, like having to navigate this feeling of like, oh my God, like I'm so, I'm struggling so much, but I, I like, I have I don't even know how to feel that because I'm having a panic attack and or I'm feeling anxious but I, I didn't even know that I was having a panic attack and that anxiety was something that was 
happen. I was struggling with on a daily basis now because I didn't know, know these things. And so part of me sometimes wish, wishes that I did get to learn those experiences and that if I wasn't faith, like, you know, protected as much as I was, but I am also very thankful too. I did learn a lot. Um, but I learned a lot of it in therapy where I finally figured, like got to learn more about myself, more about my own experiences, how I felt as an individual in comparison to like what my family felt in just like overall needs. And so like th that was the first time at 21 where I was like, oh crap, like there's a side of me that I like to do and um, what I'm going through. And so like it finally allowed me to kind of feel more independent and learn these things. But I had, I found that out like, I feel like the hard way. Yeah. I mean, I've looked for so many times in my life for guidance from somebody, wisdom for somebody that wasn't even there. You know, there was never that there. And then eventually there were a very few people in my life that had given it to me when I needed it the most. I think, you know, everyone's got their own journey to walk. You can't put yourself into someone else's shoes. You can't experience what someone else can experience, but it doesn't mean they're not similar. There does not mean there's things to it that can relate to, and there's advice you can give that might help in a situation, not fix it, but help. Yeah. And I always tell people, like, because there's always parents that come in like, oh, fix my kid, or fix this issue, or fix this problem. And I always say up front, like, I don't fix things. I help you work, like, manage them. So that way, like, outside of here, you don't need me, or, like, you're not dependent on me, but, like, work, helping you work through those stressors and the, the issues that you have going on and develop skills to independently manage. Because I always sound like, one day I hope – you know, I'm in the business of like, hopefully one day, like you don't need me uh, in that sense. But like, I don't, I like I always say, I'm like, I'm not, I can't fix it, but I can help, we, but we can work on things together. What made you turn to doing a private practice? Um, I, so I just finished my fellowship in July of this year. So um, I was at a therapeutic day school setting for two years. Um, and then, uh, before that I was at a community mental health center and I've been at two different inpatient settings. And then I've also been in another, um, community mental health setting. So like a lot of, these were all training sites. And then, um, I decided private practice. Well, I was looking at a lot of different places, but I just didn't know what I wanted to do anymore. So like, I mean, for the longest time, when I first started grad school, I'm like, oh, I want to do college counseling. Then I sort of, uh, but I like did not match at a site for like my practicums at a college counseling center. Um, but I also enjoyed inpatient, but I also realized that it was such a fast turnaround that like, I didn't feel like I was going to be as effective, um, in the work that I did. Um, and I just felt like I was working so much and constantly like just putting a lot more, even as a trainee, um, and there's just certain things I saw that I just didn't like about, um, just like, you know, uh, like politics within inpatient settings and just like stuff like that. Um, but I, but you know, it depends, right? Obviously that was years ago, but I also really, um, I knew somebody that, um, through my professor in grad school, um, and I, I reached out and so I was like, oh, let's start, just do something part-time for now. Cause I'm going to run out of <laughs> money soon. So it was more so that reason. And then, um, I ended up like through my other friend asked me, you know, like they're looking for somebody at this other private practice part-time. So I met two different private practices part-time and it's definitely a different, like one is more predominantly South Asian clients. Um, and the other one is not. And so I like the differences in clientele that I have that I get to learn. Um, but I think it just happened by coincidence. Like, you know, I'm definitely going to be here for a little bit. And like, my goal is eventually to go into my own private practice, but like, not anytime soon. But I also don't know. So I guess I'm going kind of going with the flow of things, which is really, I think, funny for me, because I never, I always knew coming into grad school, what I wanted to do, where I wanted to be. And at the end of it, I had no clue. What would you and say, I was okay with that. <laughs> what would you say the biggest issue is that you come across? Do you say, I mean, would it boil down to more politics? That seem, does that seem like an issue? Like, I feel like a lot of the problems that people consider is the fact of future tripping, which they're kind of trying to fix things that aren't in their control. Oh, I mean, I, I wouldn't say the po that was like a completely separate thing. But a lot of it is, yeah, definitely. There's, I mean, it's a wide range of, um, like, 
presenting problems that people come in with and uh, it it can vary depending on person right um so definitely mood disorders um a lot of it with it just like you know a lot of family dynamics going on too and just like that cultural difference so like the indian private practice there is a lot of that that piece of it that intergenerational differences of like how the younger generation looks at things versus how the, the parents are identifying and so um the kids get it in the sense that like hey you get it you're younger you can relate to what i'm going through but i also see that traditional side of things where parents i can relate to parents too because i was raised very traditional um in the Indian culture um, and still raised within the American culture as well. So I was able to figure out that aspect and being able to relate to both and kind of helping them come together. So um, I definitely see that in that pre that pre aspect of things, but I also see a lot of young um, teenage girls too with just a lot of difficulties like managing their emotions, like anxiety, um, the potential like self-harming and so just really working on like developing skills and being able to manage them but also having that space for them to be themselves and, and express them without judgment and providing that safe space would you say that a lot of the old traditional ways um that you've kind of come across would be more in the lines of kind of like I guess getting maybe going to school like you were saying in the beginning going you know being a doctor doing all these types of things these kind of implications that are kind of set upon you to aspire to be something because you're talking you're kind of talking about a traditional background that I don't really fully understand because there were no traditions yeah. in my house I think it's like you know when you think of like like a lot of like you know a lot of um Asians where it's like you know you're uh, like you know an engineer you're a doctor you're like you know a pharmacist or nurse or something out there right like that like people identify and so like you know I like people when they hear like Dr. Patel which is how like I when I work with my clients that's how I like refer to myself um or, or they'll refer to me and you know oftentimes like you'll think of Dr. Patel as an MD like your primary care doctor or somewhere around along those lines and the thing is like I think because it's just like growing up like oh yeah you're you're gonna go to med school or these are expectations or beliefs because we are coming from like a different country right and we want to succeed we want to do well and in a lot of these pressures like we place down onto our kids and these expectations but I think it's that meaning behind it is like to do well to succeed because you're wanting to have a better life like my dad dropped out of school um, in India in eighth grade to help out his dad in their family business so like my dad only has an eighth grade degree ish and like right now he owns like a couple businesses and is like he does well for himself and um like you know my dad parents provided for me to be able to succeed and so like part of it being the first firstborn i felt like a lot of pressure was on me to do well academically and like a lot of things like were hard for me i wasn't like I didn't get things like just like this like I it took me a while like for my grad school my doctor program it took me seven years instead of five years I ended up leaving the first program it took me a lot longer and to get things and understand it and so there is a lot of pressure that is placed on it but I feel like times definitely are changing where I've, I do have a lot of like younger friends whose parents are like you know it's whatever they want to do as long as they're happy so like I think they're like things are shifting um with more of a modern perspective and I think it's it is hard because you're bringing all those traditional values and customs here and versus like you know the conflict within the families of just like kids wanting their own different identities like different from the culture or trying to figure out who they are and parents struggling with that because it's like wait like why do you not want like these cultural things and so like i remember telling my dad like i don't want to go to med school like i just can't do it like i'm going to be way stressed out and it's not coming to me easily so then um i told him that hey i'll get a doctor and my i'll get a doctor but i'm going to do it my way and for me, I ended up like falling in love with psychology and that was the way that I did it. But I also would have been happy if I just went and got my master's degree too. But I think that was that cult aspect of it. Well, I feel like I, sh I need to do this. And um, like felt like, okay, like, you know, it'll make my parents happy too. But, I mean, I am happy with the path I went on. I do enjoy like, you know, testing and having like the opportunities that I have. But I think it's, it took me a while to kind of figure out what I wanted for myself. 
in separate, like separate from what my parents wanted for me. It's a better reason than when I went to college. I just went to college because someone told me I wasn't college material. I'm like, fuck you. I'm going to college. Hey, whatever it takes. I mean, I like one, you know, even like thinking about it, like I went to DePaul directly. My brother went to um, community college and then transferred to a school in the city. And I thought about it, I'm like, I wish I had done that. Like, I think I was so ready to get out of my house that I was just like, screw this. I'm getting away from my strict parents. Hell yeah, I'm going to live in a dorm and stay away from them um, as far as I can. But like, now that I'm older, I'm like, oh crap, I wish I saved a lot more money and went to a community college and done the same thing. But like, I wanted the freedom, like I wanted to get out of my house and I went that route. But I also realized that I wasn't ready for a lot of it because for the first time I was on my own at like 18, 19 at college and I've never been on my own at all. Like I never had that independence. My parents were very strict in high school. And so like college, I'm like, oh, this is great. Like no one telling me what to do and whatnot, like going out, like having fun, whatever it is. And I'm like, oh God. This is like, this is great. But at the, like reflecting back now, I'm like, oh, I didn't know how to manage. So like, I definitely messed up a lot my freshman year because I was doing like, it was all these things were so new to me. And I was like, my parents aren't watching. My parents aren't keeping an eye on me. This is great. So I definitely did learn the younger me, I would have like so much different advice for myself. What would you have advice for, I guess, maybe not advice, but just for people listening on the aspect of, where do you think mental health is going to go in the future? Do you think it's going to get more? I know there's so much of this push of advocacy and everything about it. And it seems like it's, it's coming more on the forefront, more people being aware of this thing, but I, I'm not seeing a whole lot of change when it comes to the actual industry of things, because people are getting it at higher rates. That's not the change I want to see. I want to see the opposite. I want to see that if mental health is declining, as in we're not seeing everybody experience depression, which I think can be solved with a lot of issues in society that is going on. Mm -hmm. More open communication, more open mindedness, mm -hmm. and more understanding somebody's perspective. Same thing you would get in a therapy session or something that listening and talking. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great point, too. And I think that I always say, like, you know, it's going to be our generation that's starting to, like, normalize mental health, and it's going to continue to take, um, I think, continue to take, like, a little bit of time before it gets to that point where it's accepted, and it's not stigmatized, or it's not shamed. And um, I think that part of it is going to take time, but I definitely do see how open people are in terms of like being, oh yeah, my therapist said this, or my therapist made me tell, uh, my, my therapist told me I need to do this. And so like all these different things of like normalizing it. And so I, that's why I put myself out there and I put my experiences out there to let other people know that, hey, I am a therapist and I graduated with my doctorate in clinical psychology a year ago. I still see my therapist, you know? Um, and I'm still like, you know, kind of like open about that. Like some days I have, like I struggle with anxiety and some days like it's great, but I think putting like ourselves and our stories and our faces out there is definitely going to also help normalize these th issues because people are going to know that, Hey, you're not alone, but yes, you're right. In that sense, like industry wise or like out there nationwide too, I think it's still going to take us time and, I, it's, I wish I like, I felt like I had a better answer to that, you know, of just like, it, it, it's honestly just going to take time. And the fact by normalizing mental health and us keep us talking about it is at least a step in the right direction. But the other piece of it is early intervention, right? Um, like, oh, sometimes it's like people go to therapy when it's like, they're at the tail end of things, things are already really bad. But it's like, okay, well, what are the signs and symptoms that we should be looking out for, right? Or like our, ourselves educating, like who will like, you know, what should we look for in somebody that might be depressed, um, or somebody that is struggling, um, and all these different things and reach out and ask, like have a private conversation with them and be like, hey, if you are struggling with anything, like know that I'm here to help and support. Um, and I also tell people too, if you are really struggling, do not hesitate. I mean, please do call like 911 and go to your nearest emergency room because it is a sign of support and it's, you're, it's not a sign of weakness. You're, they're there to help you and it's there for support, right? You're not alone in this sense or call the crisis, text the crisis, um, the crisis, oh my God, what is it? The crisis text line as well as like the crisis national hotline. 
Yeah, the crisis, there's a crisis uh, text outline as well. Um, it's 741741, you can text home to it. And um, recently, um, if you look on uh, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, I believe it did pass where the uh, 988 number um, would like replace the National Suicide Hotline, I believe, uh, phone number into just three digits like 911. So that would be out there too. So having these methods that are easier for younger individuals or anybody to access is going to be really important too for us. So I don't think it goes into effect till 2022, um, setting everything up and whatnot. But I think the biggest, the thing is like not being afraid to ask for help. And sometimes it may feel like that, but it's okay to even do it anonymously. We need to bring back reality television. <laughs> oh, in what way? <laughs> Mostly on the aspect of if you don't have conflict in your everyday life, you look for it somewhere else. And I feel like more people would invest in stop, in, I guess, in not creating real life con uh, conflict if they just saw conflict on TV. Like Jersey Shore, I did not feel the need to go bitch about a serial increase in price when I was watching Jersey Shore because I felt satisfied my life wasn't that bad compared to that because that is but a horrible way to be. They, that was like one aspect of things and I'm pretty sure those things were already out there and it was more so magnified because it was on TV versus like these things are already there. It's just that we're not having access to it on a daily basis like with Jersey Shore and stuff like that. And yeah, a lot of it could be scripted and a lot of it could be out there, but also knowing that these things are out there. We just don't see it on a daily basis. What I'm saying is if it was on television as a fake show like Jersey Shore was, you would, you would feel more complacent to not create drama in your life because you would see the best drama on television. It's a great distractor. Well, maybe I, I don't know. I might rephrase uh, my, like, I, I think of you in a different perspective of like, you know, not creating drama too, but like, you know, yeah, drama could be different for different people, right? Of like, you know, sometimes you may be reacting to something and that's a form of, you might be upset or angry, but that anger is presenting as something like your sadness could be presenting as anger or for like and reacting like outwardly versus like internalizing things that are going on and so I think I see it in a different perspective of like or maybe I'm not understanding what you're saying and that like creating drama is it more so attention seeking I think you're really trying to dissect Jersey Shore and it was a I, it was a little small no but I, I think it, I don't even know if it was like I think the what you had not dissecting I'm just saying like, bring back like the bachelor so when people come home they have something to turn on to okay so that's where you. it was because i yeah. think what you had phrased it as like you know creating that drama oh, um your own lives and I, I, I took it in a different way i'm well, like i meant I li literally necessary. go home turn on stars or wherever you like, get you know, jersey shore like, you said, like watch. mindlessly watching tv because it's kind of like an easier outlet to kind of let go and just like relax in that sense yeah, like, well, if you watch what happens on Jersey Shore, and then you're like, I don't want ever want to be like that to anybody, and then you be out, go out in the world, be a great person because you don't want to be like that. Yeah, easier said that. Yeah, could be. That's what I did every time I watched Jersey Shore. I was like, wow, I don't ever want to be someone like. Well, that. I guess you were getting insight into like your own behaviors of like, hey, I don't want to be like that. So I guess great awareness with that. I guess. I mean, if you want to yell grenade in a bar when. Uh, that's fine. Yeah, I would never do that, but <laughs> it was it was a, it's okay. I'm just thinking on it now. I'm thinking of Jersey Shore. I was like, okay, I've oh, seen I people thought like about that. that in a really long time. I'm not gonna lie though, it ha they were playing that during the Super Bowl, but I just switched them both off and flipped over to the Puppy Bowl because it was so much cuter. Oh yeah, I would I would flip over to the Puppy Bowl any day. Well, Dimple, why don't you go ahead and promote where people can find you? At? Yeah, um, I am, so currently I serve on the board of directors for um, the, uh, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, Illinois chapter. I've been on the board for two years um, and I've been volunteering with AFSP Illinois since 2014. So I have my own team, um, it's called Team Patel and it's, um, it's something that I've been, I started in 2014 in honor of my mom. And this year the team is uh, like, the whole like, walk is virtual. So it's the out of the darkness experience. And on Instagram, my public Instagram page is mental health badness. I'll make sure to link that all in the description. Thank, Thank you, you for so listening much. to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast and stay tuned for our next episode.